Welcome to the Lightroom. We're going to be talking about section 1.5 today, dealing with intersections, unions, and compound inequalities and how they all relate. So we're going to look at this first example, which is just kind of a verbal example more than a visual example. So you should have that chart in front of you. That following table shows the health risks associated with various cholesterol levels. So the total cholesterol is on the left, the risk level is on the right. So if you have cholesterol less than 200, you're normal. From 200 to 239 is borderline high, and then 240 and higher is high. Okay, so a total cholesterol level from where to where is considered borderline high. Looking at the chart, what do we have? Anywhere from 200 to 239 is that first blank. That's considered borderline high. So if we were to label our total cholesterol as a variable, maybe I'm going to call it T, how could we write those inequalities? T has to be bound down below by 200, because I could have anything larger than 200. It's considered borderline high. But it also has to be what? Less than or equal to 239. That's kind of the upper limit. So our T value, our total cholesterol level, has to be greater than or equal to 200. And at the same time, our connecting word there is and, has to be what at the same time as well? Less than or equal to our upper bound of 239. So that T value is kind of sandwiched in between a lower bound and an upper bound. So we can combine these two inequalities together. So T is both bound below by 200 and bound above by 239. Okay, these two have the same descriptors. One's more algebraic, one's more verbal. The total cholesterol level of considered borderline high is anything greater than or equal to 200 and at the same time less than or equal to 239. So those things when we kind of sandwich a variable in between a lower and an upper bound, that's an example of a compound inequality. Compound, compound inequality. Compounded between a lower and an upper limit. Okay, so when we have a compound inequality, we're combining two or more inequalities. Okay, we could have multiple variables bound between a lower and an upper bound. That's how we would have more than two. And it's either joined by the word and, like we've seen, so both have to happen at the same time, or it could be joined with the word or, so I could fall in one or fall in the other. So it could be joined by and or the word or. And we'll talk about the differences of those two visually. I think it's helpful first. So we're going to look at the intersection of two sets. The intersection means all the members that are common to both A and B. So I didn't really leave myself enough room. We'll jump up here. So common to A and B. And our connecting word there is and has to satisfy both at the same time. So we denote it with this symbol right here, kind of an upside down U, looks like a little camel hump. That tells me the intersection. I have to fall in A and in B at the same time. So visually, if we were to draw Venn diagrams to represent the intersection, we're talking about this middle section, the overlap. This shaded region is the intersection, A intersect B. Because any data point that I pick out of this middle section still lives inside of A at the same time it lives inside of B. We are in the common area between both of them. All right, so I have an example for you to try. Take these two sets of numbers now. We're gonna try to make it numeric and we'll fill in the picture later. But find the intersection of these two. What numbers live common to both of these sets? Okay, so visually we can look at it. Common between them, 
what do we have? It's going to be another set. Since we're dealing with intersecting two sets, it should produce another set. But do they share any elements in common? So I've got one in set, I'm going to call it A, the first one, and B, the second one. It's easier to talk about that way. So set A has a one, and set B has a one as well. So they share that element in common. It's going to be in their intersection. What else do they have? A two, that's going to live inside of our intersection, and a three as well. Okay, but when I look at the next element in set A, a four, I don't have a four in set B. So it's not going to live in the intersection because it's not common to both of them. So visually, if we wanted to look at this picture, where are these three going to live? Okay, this is in the intersection. They live in both A and B at the same time. So all of those elements are going to live inside of here. So I've got one, two, and three living in the intersection. But what's left over in set A that isn't common to set B? Well, what still isn't in the intersection? Four and five. So those elements would live inside of A, excluding the parts that were common with B. So what are we missing in B still here? Negative 2, negative 1, 0. Visually, now we can see they share 1, 2, and 3 in common. A has two more elements that aren't in B, and B has three elements that aren't in A. It's helpful to see visually. So when two or more sentences are joined by that word and to make a compound sentence, that new sentence is called a conjunction of sentences. We've joined them together. So that word and tells us a lot of information about what we're looking at. So the following is a conjunction of inequalities. Since we don't have equal signs, we have inequalities that are involved. So inequalities. And we want to look at the solutions for that conjunction. X has to be both satisfied in the left-hand inequality and in the right, because that word and tells us we're dealing with what? The intersection. And tells me both have to be satisfied. So that word is a kind of a trigger word telling me I'm dealing with the intersection, what they share in common. So we're going to look individually and graph these and see where they have overlap. So this first line I'm going to make that graph, the first inequality, negative 2 less than x. Another way to read that, typically we read the variable first, is what? x has to be greater than negative 2, if we read it from right to left instead. So if I make a 0 here, for instance, we need to define it somewhere on our number line. Then how do we graph this inequality? We have an open bracket at negative 2 going in the right direction. x has to be greater than or equal to that negative 2. Greater than, excuse me, not equal to. If it was equal to, we'd have that hard bracket. But it's open since we don't have the little line underneath. So that was our first inequality. Let's go ahead and graph this second one. So and was our connecting word. x has to be less than 1. So again, 0 is the same place where we marked in our number lines, x less than 1, what does that look like? Open bracket at 1 going to the left direction. Has to be less than 1. So we have to satisfy both of these at the same time, since we have that word and. We want their intersection. So what does it give? Okay, so where do they have overlap? If I pick a point on this line way out here, I satisfy this inequality, but I don't satisfy that one because it's not in my picture at all. Or I could pick one out way over here at 2, and I satisfy this inequality, x is greater than negative 2, but I'm not satisfying this one. So where is their intersection going to lie? Wherever they have overlap, where I can pick a point in one and it satisfies the other. All right, so the lower bound for this new inequality is going to be where? Negative 2, open, okay, because we have overlap here, and everywhere in between, all the way up to what? Positive 
1. So again, if that was 0 and this one is 1, anywhere in between those two is going to satisfy both at the same time. We have the overlap between them. But again, if I pick a point out here, I can satisfy one. I'm not satisfying the other. So we have to find what's common. So as an interval, how do we write this? Any x value between negative 2 and 1 looks like negative 2 to 1, open intervals, since they're not uh, the equal sign on the bottom isn't there. Okay, another way to say it. X has to be bound by what? X has to be bound above by 1. It has to be smaller than 1. And at the same time, it has to be greater than what? Negative 2. So we can combine these two inequalities together since one's a lower bound and one's an upper bound. All right. So let's look at working in an example when they're already combined together like this. Whenever it's sandwiched, we have a compound inequality. We're dealing with the intersection. The underlying connecting word is AND. So 2x plus 5 has to be both greater than or equal to negative 1. That's our lower bound. And at the same time, what has to happen over here? It has to be less than or equal to 13. That's our upper bound. So we're sandwiched in between an interval. Okay, but before, our x's were alone. And in this case, I have an expression on the inside. So we need to turn this guy into x so we can graph it. All right, so we have to solve these inequalities. We've done that before in 090 a whole bunch. So to get x alone, what's got to go first? We have to subtract 5 from every single side of the inequality. So if I subtract 5 from the middle, I have to subtract 5 from the left and from the right as well. So negative 1 minus 5 gives us negative 6. is less than or equal to 2x now, which is less than or equal to what? 13 minus 5 gives us 8. But we're not quite there because I need this to have, be, have a coefficient of 1. Right now it has a coefficient of 2. So how do we get rid of it? Divide everything by 2. And again, whatever I do to one side, we have to do to all the others as well. Negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3, less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to what? 4. So now we've found the bounds for x that will satisfy this original equation. And how can we check those answers? I could plug in numbers and make sure it satisfies the original inequality. I could plug in negative 3 since we have exactly equal to. I could plug in what else lives inside of negative 3 and 4 in that interval. Zero's in there. 1, 2, 3, 3.9999, 4 is also in there. We have a lot of options. So graphically, what does that solution set look like? As an interval, how could we uh, write it? Well, we do have the equality option. So our brackets are closed. Our lower bound is negative 3, and our upper bound is 4. So to graph it, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3. It'll fit. Nice. So if I make my 0 here, my upper bound is at 4. My lower bound is at negative 1, 2, 3. Any value in between these two will satisfy our original inequality. When our x values live inside of here, this compound inequality is satisfied. So let's try a couple. We'll do the first one together. The second one is for you. So our first hint, when we just read the problem, solve and graph this inequality and this other inequality. That word and tells me I'm dealing with what? The intersection. So what they share in common. We have to satisfy both at the same time. So I'm going to start on the left-hand one, solve that down, then move to the right. So to get x alone here, what has to move? We have to add 5 to both sides, first of all. So we'll have 2x is greater than or equal to what? Positive 2. But we need x alone. It's attached to a 2. We get rid of it by division. So our x value has to be greater than or equal to 1. So that one's simplified all the way down into the most basic form. Let's do the same over here. 5x plus 2 has to be greater than or equal to 17. 
So what's got to go first in this case? The 2. We get rid of it by subtraction. So we've got 5x is greater than or equal to 15. We need x alone, so we'll divide by 5. x has to be greater than or equal to 3. And again, what is our connecting word here? And. They have to both be satisfied. So let's graph them individually, and then we'll look for their intersection. So the first inequality in its simplest form, x has to be greater than or equal to 1. So if I my, make my 0 right here, we're going to have a closed bracket at 1 going to the right, going in this direction. So at any of these points will satisfy this inequality. Connecting word was and between them. And our next inequality, x has to be greater than or equal to 3. If my 0 still lives here, what does this solution set look like? Close bracket at 3, going in which direction? To the right. So I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, it's closed, and we're going in that direction. Looks a little bit different than what we've seen before. We don't have an upper bound on either of these. They go on for forever, off into infinity. But we have to satisfy both at the same time. So if I pick a point right here, I satisfy my first inequality, but am I satisfying the second one? No, because my solution set's over here still. If I pick one right here, am I satisfying both inequalities? Yes, because we have that overlap. So where are the common points of our solution set? Wherever they have overlap. So from, what is this value? 3 equal to 3 and anything what? Larger than that, because they're both going on for forever in that direction. So we can graph our solution set again, anywhere from 3 off into infinity. What they share in common. So what does that look like in terms of interval notation? My x value has to be what? Greater than or equal to 3. Okay. Our more restrictive interval was our solution set. So it's the smallest value of x that we can plug in. 3. And the largest value is what? Infinity. It goes on for forever. We have to satisfy both at the same time. If you think you've made a mistake, though, how could you check these? I've got infinitely many points living inside of here that I could plug in into our original inequalities, see if it works. Easiest thing is probably 3. Is it going to satisfy both of these at the same time? Pick another number living inside of there, maybe 10. Is it going to satisfy both at the same time? Okay, so there's one for you. Take this next one, solve for their intersection. We have that word and. Okay, so it tells us we're dealing with the common parts. Intersection of the two, the common between each inequality. So I'm going to work on the left first. To get 2x alone, we have to add 3 to both sides. So we've got 2x is greater than 4. When we divide by 2 to get x alone, x has to be greater than 2. So we'll graph that one here. Connecting word is and, and now let's simplify our second inequality. To get 3x alone, we add 1 to both sides. We've got 3x is less than 3. To get x alone, we have to divide by 3. So x is less than what? 1. Connecting word and, so what's common between these two? Oops, this one's our solution set. All right, so let's graph this first inequality. I'm going to make my 0 right here. Cross the board. x greater than 2. I have an open bracket at 2 going in which direction? To the right. So open at 2, going to the right. That'll satisfy my first inequality. The second one, x is less than 1. Well, 1 is here, and anything less than that goes in this direction. But I'm dealing with what connecting word? And. So what do they share in common? If I pick a point here, am I satisfying that one? No, because my solution set isn't over here. 
if I pick a point in this one, am I satisfying this inequality? No, because my solution set isn't over here. So we don't have any overlap between these two. So there's no value that I can plug in that's going to satisfy both at the same time. So what does that give us? No solutions. Set notation for that is the empty set. Circle with a line through it. Okay, and why is that happening? We can't choose, we can't choose an x value that satisfies both x being greater than 2 and x being less than 1. Okay, because if I pick a number that's bigger than 2, like 3, 3 is not less than 1. Or if I pick a number that's less than 1, like 0, 0 is not greater than 2. We can't make both of these happy at the same time. They don't have any overlap. So sometimes we have that funny case when two sets have no elements in common. When that happens, we say that the intersection of the two sets is the empty set. It's empty, and we denote it that zero with the line through it. So any two sets with an empty intersection are said to be disjoint. So what does that mean? If two sets are disjoint, visually, if we were going to draw it, what does it look like? They're separate from each other. They're disjoint. They're not joined together like a typical Venn diagram intersection like we have here. They're not touching. So disjoint sets are going to look like this. Well, here's A and here's B. Where's their intersection? Where are their common parts? They don't have any. It's empty. So sometimes that happens. We call them disjoint sets when their intersection is empty. All right, so another example, we're going to solve this inequality. And it's just to remind us about some of the rules about when we're solving inequalities. What has to happen? So to get x alone here, what do we have to do? Subtract 5 from both sides. And from both sides, so we've got 3 sides, which is kind of weird to say, but we do. So 3 minus 5, we've got negative 2 is less than or equal to negative 2x, which is less than positive 2. Not so bad. We're allowed to add or subtract. Uh, on either side of an inequality without changing anything. But now to get x alone, what do we have to do? Divide by what? Negative 2 everywhere. And when we divide by a negative with an inequality, what do we have to remember? Flip the signs around. Okay, so since we're dividing by a negative, by a negative, so, flip the signs. Super important. That relationship holds. Whenever we multiply or divide by negative, we have to flip all of the inequalities. So, a negative divided by a negative gives me a positive. But it's not less than or equal to now. It's greater than or equal to our x value, which is what? Greater than positive divided by a negative gives us a negative. Okay, but which one of those is larger? Positive one or negative one? The positive one. So typically the thing on the left is our lower bound, but right now that's our upper bound. So we can read this in the other direction from right to left and it makes a little bit more sense. So if we reorder it, what does it look like? Negative one has to be what? Less than x, which is what? less than or equal to 1. We literally just take this image and flip it around. So now our lower bound is on the left and the upper bound is on the right. Fits more naturally on the number line. So the smallest x value that we could plug in, if we want to rewrite it with interval notation, lower bound is negative 1, really close to it but never actually touching, since we don't have the little line underneath. And our upper bound is at positive 1. And we can plug that in, since we have the little line underneath. All right. 
So we can't forget that rule. If we multiply or divide by a negative, we have to flip the signs. So we looked at the intersection, what they share in common. Now we're going to look at the union between two sets. So what does it mean to have a union of two things? They're joined together. So it falls in one, falls in the other, or both. So the union of two sets, A and B, is the collection of all elements that belong to A and or belong to B. So they could be in both, they could be in one, or they could be in the other. So how do we describe that? These are the elements belonging, belonging to A, B, or both A and B. So it could be in one, could be in the other, or it could be in their common parts, in the intersection. So visually, what does it look like? We represent it with a union symbol, a U, a little cup, that tells me I fall in one, the other, or both. So if I fall in A, I satisfy anything in there. I could fall in A or B, which is in the intersection, or I could live in B without living in A. That's going to satisfy the union. I fall in one, I fall in the other, or I fall in both. So we have all of those shaded regions. So take these two sets. I'm going to label them A and B just so it's easier to talk about. Find their union. So we have the union of two sets. So our answer should be a set, should be written in set notation. So what does it mean? If I live inside of A, what elements do we have? 2, 3, and 4. So that's definitely going to be in the union since 2, 3, and 4 were in A. But what else do we have? What does set B have that A does? That common element 3. But with set notation, we don't write repeats. So 3 already shows up, it's covered. Okay, 4 isn't inside of B, but it's still in A. So it's in our union, because I could fall in one or both, or I could fall in the other. So what parts from B are we missing that we haven't reported yet? We've taken into account three, but we're still missing five and seven. So visually, again, we can fill them in. Common element that they share is three. Living inside of A alone is two and four. Leaving inside of B alone are five and seven. And our union between these two is everything. Could fall in one, could fall in the other, could fall in both. So does our set notation match our visual representation? What elements live inside of all of these bubbles? Two, three, four, five, and seven. I fall in one, I fall in the other, or I fall in both. So when two or more sentences are joined by that word or, instead of and, to make a compound sentence, the new sentence is called a disjunction of the sentences because we can't typically smush them together. We have to work on them separately. So we'll run through an example. We want to solve and graph this inequality or this inequality. So it tells me we're dealing with the union. I could fall in one, I could fall in the other, or I could fall in both if they do have overlapping parts. So solving for x, what are we doing? I'm going to work on the left. To get 2x alone, we have to subtract 7 from both sides. So we've got 2x is less than negative 8. We need x alone, so we'll divide both sides by 2. So x has to be less than negative 4. Or, let's go for the other one. To get negative 5x alone, we have to subtract 13 from both sides. So negative 5x is less than or equal to negative 10. And we're dividing by what to get x alone? A negative number. So what do we have to remember to do? Flip our sign around. So x has to be greater than or equal to what? Negative divided by negative is a positive. 10 divided by 5 is 2. So I could fall in one, or I could fall in the other. Or we could be in both. It just depends on 
what these individual solution sets look like. So let's graph it together on here. I'll go ahead and put zero right there, graphing this inequality. X has to be less than negative four. So I've got negative one, two, three, four. It'll be open going in which direction? To the left. So I want really close to negative four, never actually touching it, and anything in that direction. Graphing this inequality, what do we have? Closed bracket at two, one, two, going in which direction? Anything greater than that? So to the right. So I can pick anything in this interval or anything in this interval, and it will be satisfied, or any of the overlap. But do they have overlap? No, they don't share anything in common. I could fall in this one, or I could fall in the other. So with interval notation for these, what does it look like? Well, I could fall in one, I could fall in the other. How do we denote that? So we need that union symbol, the U, to connect two different intervals. So our lower bound on this interval, typically we read a graph from left to right. Lowest value of x that we can plug in, negative infinity, all the way up to what? Close to negative 4, but never actually touching it. Or, this is our union symbol, tells me the word or, I could fall in what other interval? Lower bound on x here is 2. Upper bound goes off into infinity. So I could fall in one, or I could fall in the other. And I will satisfy one or the other in the beginning. So one for you. Take those disjunctions and solve for x. So the first one, to get x alone, we have to do what? Add 11 to both sides. So we've got 3x is less than 15. Getting x alone, we divide by 3. x has to be less than 5. Or, what else has to happen? Over here to get x alone, get 4x alone anyway, we subtract 9 from both sides. So 4x is greater than or equal to negative 8. Dividing by 4 everywhere, x has to be greater than or equal to negative 2. So I could fall in one, or I could fall in the other, or we could fall in both. So let's graph them and see. First one, x less than 5. What are we looking at there? I'll put my 0 there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Open at 5, going in which direction? To the left, since I want anything smaller then 5, that will satisfy it. The next inequality, connecting word or, what do we look at there? x has to be greater than or equal to negative 2. So here's my 0 again. Negative 2 lives over here. Closed going in which direction? Anything to the right. So I could fall in 1. I could fall in the other, or I could fall in both, where they have overlap. So what does our solution set look like? What does that give? I could pick anything out here, and I'm going to satisfy the top one. I could pick anything in here, and I'm going to satisfy both. I can pick anything out here, and I'm going to satisfy the bottom one. I could be in the top, I could be in the bottom, or I could be in both. So we've covered that entire spectrum. We could plug in anything that our hearts desire, and we're going to satisfy both of them, one or the other. So what does our solution set in interval notation look like then? What are our lower bounds from negative infinity all the way up to positive infinity? Anything will satisfy that union of inequalities. So the last example we'll set up together, then you'll solve. So this equation, r equals 2 times the quantity, s plus 70, can be used to determine the monthly rent for an office in a renovated commercial building. All utilities are included in the monthly payment. A florist shop has a monthly rent, rental budget between 1720 2560. 
what square footage can be rented and remain within budget? So the square footage is represented by S. They don't tell us that, but it's kind of intuitive. Then the rental budget is capital R. So capital R, the rental budget, is bound between what values? What's our budget? The smallest amount that we can spend and still have it be a decent place is 1720. So I could pay that amount or I could pay more, but I don't want to pay any more than what? $2,560. So we still have to be within budget. But what are they asking us for? What square footage can be rented in order to remain within budget? So we have an inequality in terms of budget, 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 but we need it in terms of S. So I know that R is equivalent to what? 2 times the square footage plus 70. So we can interchange that here. 1720 is the lower bound, and my square footage has to still remain within budget. So go ahead and take that inequality, solve for S, and interpret what it means in a sentence at the end. Whenever we have applied problems, we want to state it in a sentence. So what did you do first here? Trying to dig out S, so let's get rid of the coefficient on the front. Divide everything by 2. 1720 divided by 2 is 860. And we don't need the parentheses now. 2 divided by 2 is 1, it goes away. We've gotten here. 2560 divided by 2 is 1280. And we need S alone, so what do we get rid of? Subtract 70 from everywhere. So we have 790 for our lower bound, S on the inside, and 1210 for our upper bound. So what does that tell us? The square footage has to be between what to stay within budget? 790 is the smallest, and 1210 is the largest. So this lower bound of the square footage will hit our lower bound for our budget. This upper bound for the square footage will hit our upper bound for our budget. So we want to say that in a sentence. The square footage must be between 790 square feet and 1210 square feet to remain in budget. And again, how could we check? We could check maybe the upper bound, for instance. If my square footage is 1,210, what should be my cost monthly for that place? 2,560. And we could check. So what is R equal to when S is 1,210? When we plug it back into our original formula, what do we get out? $2,560. We could also check the lower bound. Okay, and anywhere in between those two will also satisfy falling within our budget. We fit within the bounds. All right, you survived. So get working on that homework. If you have any questions, shoot me an email. I will be answering them. Let me know if you have any troubles.